Hello and welcome back for chapter 3 of CCNA2 Routing and Switching Essentials with me, Joachim Schäfer-Stolt from the University of Hövde. And the topic of today is to look into dynamic routing. So we talked about static routing and how to statically set routes for remote networks in the last lesson, but now we're going to look about how we can do it dynamically so we can have routers automatically learn about uh, about routes to remote network. And we're going to do this by looking at uh, the routing information protocol RIP version 2, which is sort of deprecated on, or sort of legacy and not used that much, but it's going to be used in this in this course for demonstrative reasons. Then we're also going to dig deep into the routing table and remember to stop and do the practicals. So starting with dynamic routing, it's been in use since the 1980s and it allows routers to exchange information about networks and dynamically learn routes to remote networks. So there are some pros of this that we're going to discover, uh, including that the router, the configuration is much easier for large networks and routers are able to uh, adapt to changes in the topology, sort of when a link, uh, such as when a link fails. And as you can see in the picture here, there are a bunch of uh, dynamic routing protocols and are classified as interior gateway protocols or exterior gateway protocols. Interior gateway protocols can be said to be used within a network and uh, which would be called an autonomous system and an exterior, uh, exterior gateway protocol is mostly used by ISPs to route between different autonomous systems. So uh, RIP that we're going to look at in this case is a distance vector protocol. And just to be aware of, uh, for your awareness, there is another distance vector protocol called EIGRP. And then there are link state protocols, uh, OSPF and ISIS. So I'm not going to, to go through that more at all uh, because that's the main topic of CCNA3, which is the next course. So let's look at dynamic routing from a high perspective. The purpose of dynamic routing protocols is always to discover remote networks, maintain up-to-date routing information, shows the best path for destination networks, and find new path if the first one fails. So in short, you can say that the manual labor that we did in the last lesson where we uh, manually looked at and examined the network and uh, looked on how to best Im implement routing in that network. Uh, that is what dynamic routing protocol do, uh, does automatically. And at a high level, the components of dynamic routing is data structures, and that is databases and information that need that is needed for the operation of the routing protocol and that is kept in the RAM. So it's lost when the router has a power cycle. You also have router protocol messages, and those are used to discover neighbors, uh, namely to discover routers on the other, other end of the link and exchange routing information. And finally, we have an algorithm, and that is uh, basically the list of steps used by the routing protocol in its operation. So that the algorithm will describe how to do stuff. Uh, so before we move on, what about static routing? Is that something that we should just remove now? No, it isn't. It, it does have some advantage, advantages. So first, it's easy to implement in a small network. Um, well, I would say that that's not a reason for using it because implementing dynamic routing in a small network is, as we will see, also quite easy. Uh, however, it's very secure, and that is because when you do dynamic routing, every router will send routing advertisements that are used to... Uh, to inform the neighboring routers about the networks that it knows about. And in theory, someone could fetch up those packages and use them to outline the network. That is not something that can be done with static routing, so it has a security advantage. Uh, also, the route to the destination network always stays the same, which is, well, both a good and a bad thing, I would say, because it causes predictability, but it also makes uh, for a case where the ad administrator has to reconfigure the network when, it, when something happens. Uh, well, finally, there is no routing algorithm or update mechanism, so there are no uh, extra CPU or RAM uh, resources needed. However, on the on the disadvantage side, it only works for small networks because it's very hard to maintain a large network topologies. Um, and you need to do manual intervention when when something happens within the network. So why should we need dynamic routing? And what I want to do is just to show you this picture. So consider configuring static routing in this network where you have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21 and more networks. 
So configuring static network in this topology that is, an actu that is actually not that, that extreme is going to be a hell to go through. So instead we can use dynamic routing and then we would just uh, enable dynamic routing on all the routers and they would, they would share information about the networks and learn automatically. So looking at some pros and cons of dynamic routing. Um, so first on the good side, it's suitable in basically all uh, topologies where multiple routers are required. So it won't work if you only have one router because then it can't share any information. But if there are more routers, then dynamic routing is well suitable. Uh, also, it's generally independent of the network size. If you want to add a router, so say that you want to add a router to this topology, you want to add a router here. If you work with static routing, you're going to have to configure loads and loads of routes on that router. But if you add a dynamic router, you just add it and configure it for a dynamic router and it's going to learn. Um, also, it automatically adapts the topology to rewrite traffic if it's possible, if there is a change in the topology. So in this case, if this router is configured to take this path to reach the networks down here, and this path fails, well, then the traffic isn't going to go there. But if you use dynamic routing, it will be able to recalculate and realize that it can also take this path, and the networks will still be reachable. So on the on the negative side, they can be more complex to implement. Yep, uh, they can be less secure, uh, as we just discussed. But there are configuration settings that you can do to still enhance the security. Uh, also, the route will depend on the current topology, which uh, makes for a case where it's quite hard to predict where traffic will go. Um, and it also requires some additional CPU, RAM and link bandwidth to share information and to calculate best path and so on and so forth. So that being said, let's go have a look at uh, routing information protocol or RIP that we're going to use that we're going to use to demonstrate dynamic routing in this course. Uh, first, know that it's rarely used in modern network for the sole reason that there are so much better alternatives that are equally easy to configure. Uh, and also you enable it on a router by typing the command router RIP in configuration terminal. And you also see below here that the topology that we're going to work with in the next few in, in the next few slides. So this is the first step going into configuration terminal and doing router rip to enable the rip uh, to enable rip but after knowing that you need to inform the router uh, about what networks to advertise to the other routers and what interfaces to use for communicate communicating with other routers and you do this with the network command so when you type router rip and hit enter you go into the rip configuration mode so say that we're on router 1 the next step that we have to do is tell router 1 that it's going to advertise information about this network and about this network it also has to know that it's going to use the interface here or this network to communicate with router 2 so we do that with the network command uh, so doing the network command and then we type the network that we want to advertise. So in this case we do network 192.168.1.0 and then we do network 192.168.2.0 to advertise this network. So advertising a network also enables the interface belonging to that network for, uh, for sending router advertisements to other routers. So that's all the configuration that we need to do. And then we would do the same on router 2 but in that case we would advertise this network this network and this network and finally we advertise this network and this network on router 3. And also when two routers that are joined by a link are both advertising this network uh, the same network here then they're going to form an adjacency and that is when they are going to start sending networking information to each other. So what's going to happen here is that router 1 is configured to advertise this network so is router 2 so they're going to form an adjacency on this link here and be neighbors and then they're going to share the routing information and the network information they that they have so router one is going to tell router two hey i have access to the network 192.168.1.0 and router two is going to say oh nice thank you i'll add that to my routing table and now router two is aware of that network and it knows that the next hub address is through router one also router two is going to say okay so I know about network 192.168.3, 192.168.4, and 192.168.5. And sending that to router 1, router 1 will say, okay, nice, I'll add that to my routing table. And then the same thing, uh, communication will happen between router 2 and router 3. 
and then all networks in the all, or all routers in the topology will know about all the networks in the topology and when you reach that say, stage you say that, a, that, that that network is converged so we have to look at some verification of tu uh, and tuning of rip before we move on so first off there is a command that is show ip protocols and with that you can verify that rip is running and see what networks that are advertised and what net interfaces that are being used also, you should know that as default, RIP version 1 is used, and that is very legacy. Uh, also, it only supports classful networks, so when you do this network command, it's going to assume that you mean the classful version of that network. Uh, so what you want to do is that you want to do the version 2 command in the RIP configuration to change mode to version 2. And uh, when you do that, all routers in the routing domain, so this is a routing domain, all routers in the routing domain has to use version 2 um, and what, we want, what we're going to do then is uh, that we're going to do something that is called no auto summary so the default behavior is that auto summarization is used and that means that RIP will summary, summarize networks at, at classful boundaries and that means that subnetted networks that doesn't follow the classful ABC boundaries are not correctly advertised. And we can fix this by disabling out a summary with a no, no out of summary command. Uh, remember, though, that RIP version 2 does have support for subnetted networks. Uh, so this only works for RIP version 2, while as RIP version 1 does not have support for subnetted networks. So doing no, no out of summary would have no effect. So. Uh, also, by default, router messages are sent out all interfaces enabled with a network command, even if there are no router on the other end. Uh, this uh, will waste bandwidth and also be a security risk. So what we can do is use the passive interface and then inter uh, specify an interface in a RIP configuration mode to disable routing updates from being sent out that interface. It will not have any effect on routing, routing or what networks that are being advertised. It will just say that, hey, on this gigabit Ethernet interface, do not send out routing updates. And looking back at the topology, for router one, there is no reason uh, why router one should send out routing updates to uh, to the switch network here because there will only be hosts. However, if someone like me were to put in a rogue router here and enable it for RIP, then router one would inform that router and say, hey, I also know about networks connected to router two and router three, and I as a hacker can use that information to build a topology of the network. So that's the security issue I've been talking about. So passive interface is used to minim minimize waste of bandwidth and to mitigate the security risk. So on some more tuning, uh, remember that doing a statically configured default route can be uh, can be good, especially if you have one way out of the internet. Then you're gonna s say to a router that hey, if this isn't for an internal network, a network in my routing table, then you just send it this way, and it's gonna reach the internet, and someone else can take care about it. So you can use RIP to propagate a statically configured default route to other routers in the routing domain. And what you want to do then is begin with yes, configuring the static default route. And then you use the command default information originate in RIP configuration mode. So now that we know all about that, we're going to do a configuration task. And then we're going to get back to a deep dive into the routing table. So uh, what we have here is a... Uh, it's an assignment that where we're going to configure RIP in this domain. And remember that in the last lesson, we had a similar topology where we had to configure a lot of static routes. So looking at from the point of view of router one, it's not even aware about the existence of router three, much less the existence of the networks behind router three. So with static routing, we have to specify the path to the network. But in this case, we're just going to enable RIP on all the routers and they can just go on with it. So let's begin with taking care of router one. So router one, oops, where did you go? Router one, let's go into the CLI. And what we're gonna do is that we will go to enable and then configure a terminal. And then we're going to enable rip with the command router rip. So that's it. Next thing we're gonna do then is advertise the networks that is connected to router one. Let's not do the internet one right now because we're gonna do that with a static default route, but let's just do PC one as the beginning. So we do network, no, first off, always forget 
default version is version one that doesn't and we also have auto summary on by default and we don't want that so what we're going to do is begin with version two and no auto summary uh, in my opinion just make it a best practice to do version two and no auto summary whenever you're working with rip so next step then the networks so we do network 192.168.10 uh, to inform the router to advertise the PC1 network. And then we also have to do network 192.168.20 to inform the network to advertise the network pointing to R2. And that will also enable the router to start sending out routing messages on that link that can enable it to form an adjacency with router 2. So moving on then to router 2. CLI. We actually gonna do the same configuration. So we go enable configuration terminal router rip to enable the to enable rip, and then we do uh, we do version two to set it to version two, which supports VLSM and all of that nice things. And then we do no auto summary, and then we go on doing the networks. So first we do network and we can do start with the PC2 network, which is going to be 192.168.30. Then we can do the network pointing towards router 3, which is 40. And then finally the network pointing towards router 2. And now that router 2 and router 1 are both advertising and have RIP enabled on this network, then they can form an adjacency and they can start exchanging routing information. So the way that we can verify that it's, they are actually exchanging routing information is that at this time, router one should have informed router two about the PC one network. So we can verify that that happened by looking at a routing table. So what we do is we go do show IP route, and then we can actually see here in the routing table that there is one route denoted R and the uh, route denoted R, if we look at the codes up here, is a RIP-learn route, and it's a route for the network 192.168.10, which is the network here, connected to uh, the PC1 network. And um, so, before we leave router 2, what we're gonna do is ensure that no routing updates are sent out to the PC2 networks, because remember, that's a security issue. I know that I didn't do it for PC1, who cares, it's a practical, but in this case, we are gonna do it for router 1, so what we're gonna do is we do passive interface, and we do gigabit ethernet 0, 0, and now there are no routing updates sent out to the PC2 network. So finally, we're going to do uh, router 3, Again, it's the same configuration. So we do enable configuration terminal. We do router rip to enable rip. We do version two so that we can go rip version two. We do now the summary because we don't want networks to be summarized. We want the routing to behave as we as we manually configured. Then we use the network commands. We begin with network 192.168.40 for the network pointing towards router two. And then we do network 192.168.50 for the network connected to PC3. Uh, and then we wait a little bit for the network to converge and converge is when router three, router two, and router one all knows about all networks. We can do fast forward time here in Packet Tracer to speed up the process uh, and not have to wait for it. And then we look at the routing table. So we go do, do show IP route, and now in this case, there are actually several routes that are learned through RIP, as you can see by the top three rows here. So we have one route for network 192.168.1, which is PC1. We have 192.168.2, which is the linked network between router one and router two. And we have 192.168.3, which is the route connected to PC2. And you can see also that the metric value uh, here is one for uh, the 2.0 and for the 3.0 and it's two for uh, the network with PC1 here, the 1.0 network. And that is because RIP uses hop count as a metric. So what it does when calculating the metric is, base, is just that it calculates the number of hops towards the end network, the number of routers that it has to, to traverse. So looking at the PC2 network from the router 3 point of view, you have to traverse router 2 
that is one, and therefore the metric is one. To get to the PC1 network, you have to traverse router two, that's one, router one, that's two, that's weird. So one hop on router two, two hops on router one, and then the metric is two. And the administrative distance is 120, and you can see the next top IP, and you see the exit interface from router three's point of view. So uh, finally, we're going to do passive interface again because we don't want routing updates being sent out to the uh, PC network. So we do passive interface, EBIT Ethernet 0, 0, and that's done. And now finally, we're going to configure a static default route on router 1, and we're going to configure a static default route out this serial 0, 0, 1 interface, and we're going to propagate that within the routing domain. So what we do then is that we go to the uh, to router one, we go back to configuration terminal, and we begin with uh, using IP route to configure a static default route. So IP route zero 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 zero, the exit interface which is going to be serial zero zero one, and then we hit enter. So next we go into router rip again and then we use the command default information originate and that is going to cause router one to propagate the static default route within the routing domain and how we can verify that the simplest is by going fast forward time and then we go into router three and we do uh, do show IP route again and now we see that there is a route down here for the 000 network it's via the IP address of router 2, which is the next top address from router 3's point of view. And that means that we managed to propagate a static default route. You can also see that a gateway of last resort is set. So that is it. Uh, before we end, I'm going to show you this show IP protocol. Show IP protocol. Uh, and if I do show IP protocol, you can see that routing protocol is RIP. You can see what interfaces that are uh, that are in you that are in use. You can see what networks it's routing for. You can see what interfaces that are configured as passive, and you can see uh, what sources of routing information that we have. So let's go back to the theory to deep di uh, to dig even deeper into the routing table. Uh, I realize that a big focus of this course is the routing table, and it should be because it's quite important. So uh, if there are any questions, come and field or grab a teacher and uh, make sure that you pause and do the practical as well to really grasp the context-based micro tra uh, training approach. But uh, when we get back, routing table. So uh, this is an output of the routing table just to show you how it looks. We should remember because we were just there in the, in the practical. Uh, and the routing table, as we know, is made up from routing table entries. It begins with specifying what the gateway of last resort is, if there is one. And the gateway of last resort, as we remember, is for package, packages that are for networks that are not specified elsewhere in the routing table are sent. And then we have a lot of routing table entries. Uh, and for now, we're just going to dig deep into a, uh, into a specific routing table entry. So looking at a routing table entry, it begins with specifying the route source. And now we see in the R, which is for RIP, you can also have S, which is for static, C, that is for connected, L, that is for locally connected interfaces, and a bunch more for other dynamic routing protocols. Uh, after route source, we have the destination network address specified. And that is, well, the network that this route, routing entry is for. Then follow, uh, follows the administrative uh, distance, and the administrative distance makes uh, describes the trustworthiness for a route. The lower the AD, the more trustworthy the route. So an AD for a connected route is zero, and an AD for a static route is one, meaning that connected routes and static routes are very trustworthy. Uh, dynamic routes will have different administrative distances, but always above one. So then we have the metric, uh, and metric will be calculated differently but, uh, depending on how the route is learned. So for dynamic routing protocols, the metric can be diff uh, very different, but, uh, but when you're using RIP, the metric will be the hop count, the number of routers that you have to traverse to get to the des destination networks. And the metric for all static and connected routes will always be zero, unless you do a static route where you specify the 
uh, where you specify the mat metric. Um, then we have the next hop IP address, and uh, that is the IP address of the next hop router. Then we have the route timestamp, how long ago it was learned, and then we have the outgoing interface. So that's the routing table in detail. Let's move on looking at a routing table structure. Uh, and actually, the routing table is hierarchically structured, and that is to speed up the route lookup process. And uh, to explore this hierarchy and how the route, how the lookup process looks in detail, we have to know about some different types of routes. So we have ultimate routes, level one routes, level one parent routes, and level two child routes. And now we're going to know what that is. So looking with uh, looking to ultimate routes, ultimate routes is routes that has a next hop IP or an exit interface, uh, and this can be connected dynamically learned. Uh, or local routes and looking at the uh, the output or the partial output from a show IP route here you can see that almost every route is an ultimate route and this is basically routes that can be used on the fly so looking at, at any of these routes uh, you can send traffic to any of these networks because you know the next top IP is here or and or the exit IP uh, the exit interface so uh, moving on then to level one routes uh, and level one routes are always ultimate routes that are also um, and this is when things become a little bit complex it's a route to a network with a subnet mask equal to a classful subnet uh, or a supernet route meaning a route to a network with a mask less than a default mask so this is something that I really encourage you to look on more in the material. But what, uh, uh, what this means is that it is a route which is uh, either um, a route that matches a classful subnet mask. So it can be a route to, for instance, 162, uh, 162, uh, or 192.168.1.0 uh, slash 24 because that would be a class for class C network, but it can also be 192.168.0.0 because that is a supernet route, meaning that is it's a route that covers many class C networks. Uh, and a default route will also be an ultimate level one route. So looking towards the opposite of level one routes, which would be level two child routes, level two child routes are ultimate routes to networks that are subnets of classful networks. So looking, for instance, at the, uh, the routes in the output here, looking at 172.16.1, 2, 3, and 4 routes, uh, 172, or the classful version, the classful network that those belongs to, are 172.16.00 slash 16. So since that is a classful class B network, then 172.16.2.0 slash 24 would be a subnet of that classful network and therefore it's a level two child route. Um, and they are also ultimate routes. So finally then we have level one parent routes and level one parent routes are not ultimate routes. So as you see in the output here, 172.16.00, and slash 16, this is a parent level one parent route and that is because it does not have an XTOP IP address or exit interface. Um, instead, it's a level one route that is submitted. So in this that way, uh, whenever you have level two child routes, you will also have level one parent routes. If this isn't sticking, I can, uh, I can, um, I can understand you because this is a little bit complex and mind bubbling, but go into the material and read it carefully. Uh, and before, because now we're going to look on the routing process or the route lookup process. So whenever a routing decision is to be made, the following route lookup process takes place. You will go through the routing table, you receive a package as a router, and what you're gonna do is you're gonna look through your routing table and you're going to look for the best match uh, for that package. We're going to look at what a best match is in a little while, but we're going to find the best match, uh, the best matching route for that package. So if the best match is a level one route, uh, a level one ultimate route, then it will be used to forward the package. 
if the best match is a level one parent route, then the process is going to continue. So if there is a matching level two route, it will be used. And if there is not any matching level two route, then the process is going to be, con uh, to be continued. Then the continued process will be looking for a lesser matching level one route. If there is one, it will be used to forward the package. And if there is no matching route, then the package is going to be drop, so, dropped. So the idea here is that remember that a static default route is always a level one is a level one route, but it's always going to be a lesser matching level one route. That means if there is a more precise level one route, then it's going to be used to forward a package. If there is a more precise level two route, then that's going to be forwarded uh, used to forward the package. So how do we know what a best match is? Well, a best match is the longest match. So looking at an IP address uh, or a package with the destination address of 172.16.0.10. Then if we have different routes to that, net that network, so we have one route to 172.16.0.0 slash 12, that means that the 12 first bits in the IP address makes out the network address, then that is a match, but it's a match up to those 12 bits. Then we have another route. We have a slash 18 route. That means that it will be a match that is 18, bit, 18 bits long because it's still matching the full network address, but the network address is on, uh, only 18 bits long, so it can only match 18 bits. Then we have a third route, which is a slash 26 route. Uh, or to a slash 26 network, meaning that it, the network address is 26 bits long and it also matches. So that's going to be the longest match and therefore it's going to be the best match. So remember that a static default route is a slash zero, so it's gonna match, but it's gonna match with zero bits, which is a little bit weird, but that means that it's always going to be the shortest match, meaning the worst, and it's only gonna be chosen if there is no other route to that network. So contemplate this for a while. Uh, for this, I would really encourage doing the end of section test yourself tasks that are presented in the Cisco CCNA material because that will really help you grasp this. And this content is quite important. So finally, before we end, we're going to look at the IPv6 routing table and it's almost the same, but you should know that IPv6 is classless by design. So there are only level one ultimate routes available. You, uh, you can't have those layer one, uh, level one parent routes and level two child routes and stuff unless you have a classful protocol and IPv6 is classless. So there is only level one ultimate routes with IPv6 and that can be a relief. Also, you should know that link local addresses are used as next top addresses. So that's why you, why you usually see those FE80 addresses as next top addresses. And with that said, this is the end. There is no ending demonstration for this chapter. If there are any questions, grab a teacher or put them in the comments field. And I will see you next time where we go get back to uh, for some nice switching. So this was it for CCNA 2 uh, Chapter 3 with me, Joachim Schäferstadt from the University of Hovde. I hope you learned something.